We got stress cause we're striving, surviving, keep on moving to improving, rearranging. The whole world's changing, pandemic, systemic, rule making, rule breaking, disagreeing, no we're fighting or fleeing. Got a mind. Welcome to Minding the Gap podcast brought to you by Behavioral Sciences of Alabama. I'm Paul Bakke, licensed therapist, uh, alongside, as usual, Dr. David Barnhart. And Dr. Barnhart, this morning, I'm going to let you introduce our guests who are, who are with us to special guests to talk about ethical dilemmas and the stress that that creates uh, for us today. Oh, wow. That, I, I didn't know I was going to get to do this. This is yeah. really uh, this is really a pleasure uh, to do. So uh, so we have Dave Barnhart, Jr., uh, who has the same name of, as me. Uh, and I always claim to people that because I wasn't creative enough to come up with another name, <laughs> he got saddled with mine. Uh, but uh, Dave's an ordained uh, pastor and he studies uh, mental health issues and he's completing a, a degree in um, clinical counseling. Um, he, his degree is uh, ethics homiletics yeah. uh, from uh, some place up north of here. <laughs> so the Vanderbilt University. Um, and Melanie Barnhard Alvarez uh, is my favorite daughter and my favorite son uh, is here. And Melanie is... Um, she, oh, my, uh, she graduated from Birmingham Southern, which is, is my undergraduate alma mater. Forgot, forgot about that. And then she went on to do great things um, at the University of Alabama in uh, Birmingham. Uh, she did residency in, what was that, Northwestern Chicago, part of your residency, and finished up at UAB in emergency medicine. You got to say something, Melanie. Otherwise, your picture won't show up on the on the Zoom call. Oh, I have to talk. So yes, I'll... you have to okay. talk. <laughs> and, yeah, so and we have the three Dr. Barnharts here. Yes, the three Dr. Barnharts: <laughs> Mo, Larry, and Curly. <laughs> uh, so we'll see. We'll see which is which. <laughs> so, so why? So Melanie deals in emergency medicine and. You know, there's been a lot of uh, publication in recent years, uh, Paul, about um, uh, moral injury and moral stress, which is the topic uh, for today. But certainly we see the evidence of that from uh, frontline healthcare workers. Uh, we see that in obviously in military, but, but in all kinds of situations, people deal with moral stress well you just take the the response to the pandemic just as an example there's all kinds of when you're making policies about things and dealing with uh, how to combat you know and create policies around this you have protection you have economic issues that affect people and that's that's where you know that's where a lot of the the freedom issues, you know, civil liberties and constitution and, you know, I'm a free person, you know, I'm, should I be made to do this? Uh, and then the policies to, to help people uh, financially. So there's all kinds of situations that, that are values that are all important. And then some take more precedence or uh, some take more importance than, than others. And so you have this, ethical dilemma and possibility of moral in injury when someone is having to make decisions or carry out decisions that have been made by somebody uh, above them that may go against, uh, may go against their, uh, their belief systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dave, we were, you were talking earlier about uh, this issue in organizations in general. Yeah, one of the one of the articles uh, that you shared um, talks about the effect on turnover and burnout in in people. Um, 
typically, if, if people are under a lot of moral stress for long periods of time, um, they can they, they can get burned out. They think about changing jobs, um, and we see that we see that happening a lot, especially towards at the end of the pandemic. Uh, one of the things, and um, we've seen right now, there's a not only are there a lot of people leaving church, there are a lot of pastors leaving uh, pastoral ministry. Um, oftentimes because they're because of I think probably moral stress. I I know a person who, as, as Paul is mentioning, because of uh, mask controversy in their congregation uh, had to deal with a lot of interpersonal stress, <clears throat> but also you know thinking like what what if I if I know what I think is the right thing to do and yet there are these constraints organizationally or whatever around me that event that I come to resent the organization and um, and uh, you know same thing happened mentioning with um, medical professionals uh, sometimes there's there's what they see as the right decision and then there's the the constraints that they're operating under either bureaucratically you know um, or or insurance insurance yeah how does insurance work melanie <laughs> Well, um, you know, one of the reasons um, I went into emergency medicine is so that I didn't have to worry as much about insurance. Um, uh, I get to treat everybody no matter what. Um, and luckily I work at a hospital too that um, is supportive of that. Um, uh, you know, being a nonprofit organization, they, you know, um, will are very open and and you know encourage us treating patients that, that don't have insurance um but i still run into the problem of <clears throat> follow-up um a lot of times patients um just taking for example you know a uh, gallbladder issue um you know it may not need to come out today but it's causing the patient a lot of pain and stress and you know, um, they need to, it needs to come out. It's just not an, you know, emergency. Um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so, uh, I end up, you know, having to let those patients follow up as an outpatient, which can be difficult if you don't have health insurance. Um, and then, you know, you know, I think as the further we get into this pandemic too, seeing a lot of people with, you know, kind of post COVID, um, sequela, um, and not having, you know, follow up, uh, you know, whether they're having like permanent lung, you know, or semi-permanent, you know, prolonged uh, lung issues or um, fatigue and things like that, um, you know, can, uh, it can be difficult. You just, they come end up coming back over and over mm -hmm. to the emergency department and you have to keep telling them like, I wish I could do something, but there's nothing I can do to help you. What you need is this. And mm -hmm. um so that's kind of how insurance, you know, plays into it with us. So their lack of uh, care after they get out of the emergency room, they're not able to follow up mm -hmm. because they don't have the money or insurance coverage. Yeah. I had a, a patient recently that it did end up, he had to go in or undergo an emergent surgery. Um, this was several years ago. And uh, it was at a different hospital. The surgery was, his bill ended up being um, like eighty thousand dollars after um, after he underwent the surgery. Um, and then a few years later, he ended up with a complication from it, or not a few years, a few months later, ended up with a complication from it that he didn't want to go get fixed because he knew it was going to be another, you know, whatever ten grand or something that he didn't have, um, especially after coming out of this you know, hospitalization, this particular complication ended up making it a lot more difficult for him to have children. Um, and, you know, really affected his life in a lot of different ways. Um, he couldn't be as active as he wanted to be. And, um, I saw him recently kind of, you know, with, with still this complication affecting, a, um, <clears throat> luckily I talked to a very nice, um, surgeon that was willing to see the patient as an outpatient. So, um, but, but that happens frequently where they, you know, things like that happen. And then the patient either can't or doesn't want to seek care because they're afraid of the bill. Mm -hmm. How about that from the standpoint of, um, ministry, Dave? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think this is, this is one of the things where 
so often, you know, we, we, one, one of the aspects of moral injury, so I, that's, you know, there's moral distress. So mm-hmm. the literature talks about moral stress or moral distress and then moral injury. Mm-hmm. And one of the things about moral injury is, you know, we, we want to see ourselves as good people who make moral decisions. And we have a, we have an image of ourselves of, of how we, how we operate in the world. And oftentimes a crisis, a moral crisis or, or prolonged moral stress changes the way that we see ourselves and our role in the world uh, or in society. Um, you know, I guess it's, it's really something obvious, like if you have a, someone with PTSD and they've had to shoot a child soldier in a combat situation or whatever. And so there's, they're struggling with this uh, understanding of, or they've, they've done something that they, that they deeply regret. Um, and, and part of the, the cognitive piece of that is, am I a good person? Um, mm-hmm. How do I see myself as a as a moral agent? Um, and then then there's the other I think piece of that though is is realizing how how in some situation realizing how little impact you can actually have or how how powerless you are in this in in the world situation. Like mm-hmm. um, society's broken in so many ways, right? And there are these these moments that pushes us up to to a to an edge where we realize, man, the world is really screwed up, and I I am I am not I can't heroically fix this the way that I would like to imagine that I would. Um, I'm not as much of a hero as I thought I I am. Or I, that's mm-hmm. you know hero's kind of exalted language, but just the idea of um, I I don't have as much power to do good as I had thought that I did. Mm-hmm. Um, and and part of that is so part of that also is is where you where you imagine the locus of control is whether you like I'm the agent who's responsible for this I'm the one who did this mm-hmm. or this is a pro, this is a bigger problem and it's not just me like this is and I think you know when you're dealing with moral injury part of that is is trying to understand help people see that um, to have kind of a, a more realistic picture of your moral agency in a very complicated world. Um, I think that's it's the the situation Mm -hmm. that that I'm put in. That's, that's part, a big part of the issue. It's, you know, it's being, it's not just me, but it's the situation where I'm faced with, like you said, a child. So, you know, I'm in combat and I'm doing what I'm been trained to do. It doesn't make me a bad person. It's the situation of a broken world that created this and I'm only do the best I can do. And that's, that's difficult because, and, and that can lead to, uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, we talk about habituation quite a bit, at, you know, with anxiety and leaning into this uncomfortable feeling and getting used to that feeling. And then the feeling gets easier as, as you face your anxiety. Well, the same thing can happen with immoral decisions. We can go, Oh, it's a situation. You know, I'm, I'm just, just taking care of my own. I'm just doing what I'm told to do, even though it's, uh, you know, unethical to do it. I'm, you know, it's not me. It's everything. Else. Yeah. So it's, and then, then there's, you know, then that can be unhealthy mm-hmm. uh, as a, it's a coping me- mechanism to be able to sort of avoid the, the difficulty of it. And then, you, but you also have other people that are involved in it that are going, this just doesn't, this doesn't feel right. You know, this is just, penetrating my my heart you know this the value system that i have and so it's it's this back and forth toggling back and forth between just dealing with the situation the best you can um trying to find a situation that that lines up with your morals as best as possible learning to accept the things you cannot control and it's it's just a very difficult back and forth that you can get on one extreme or another on you know, one one of the as you as you were talking about how that that um, those extremes and how it's you know on, on the one hand you can you can make up excuses for yourself, right? On on the other hand, there's sort of that self compassion piece that you need to have when you do make a mistake or whatever. Um, I'm I think about when I was when I was 16 or so. I guess I I just started driving, um, I, and and I had grown up reading, um, Boy's Life, about you know people people doing heroic things like doing first aid someone someone's in a wreck on the 
side of the road and you pull someone from a car, you know, that kind of, that kind of stuff. Like we imagine what we would do in a stressful situation. Um, and uh, I remember I was, I was coming home late at night and a car that was going way, I mean, they were racing or something. They were going way too fast, blew around me and it scared me because I thought, I, I thought they were going to hit me. And they went into a ditch and the car went up and it flipped and crashed. And um, it was pretty, pretty dramatic. Uh, scared the bejesus out of me because I, I was still a new driver. Um, it really and, turned uh, him into an excellent driver. I might I have been sure. a very cautious driver ever since. Well, so, but like all the, but all these other people stopped and I didn't stop. And I drove, I drove on by and I was, I was shaking, but I drove on by and I you know, pulled in at a gas station. I called my parents to come get me. And, and I, for a while after that, I, I, struggled with that like i didn't i didn't stop i thought i was the kind of person who would stop but but it, you know I, and going back and thinking about it i was 16 years old new driver obviously i'm i'm anxious you know yeah. when that that kind of thing happens so i i i, I have self-compassion i forgive myself for not stopping you wouldn't but have been peaceful if you had stopped in that state of mind you know well exactly i would have been oh you know <laughs> <laughs> but but like we so often like we think we know what we would do in a situation and you don't until you're in it. Um, like when I think about that police officer at the school shooting so uh, a while back where he waited five minutes and everyone's like, why didn't he, why did he wait so long? I'm like, you don't know. I, I think dad pointed out, he may have thought it was 30 seconds because his, you know, his fight or flight um, or freeze reflex was activated. He may have thought it was 30 seconds. His time, his sense of time wasn't like, you don't know what you would do until you're thrown into the situation. And I think so often, like, that's what we have yeah. to, like, I have to keep the one pushing back yeah. on to that. So like this ideal yes. thing, forget it. <laughs> because in the, because when we're thinking about it, we're, think, we're not in the, we're not have the emotion and the, that reflex that says protect yeah. that we, that's out of our control. We think we're thinking rationally, like, oh, you know, that's, they should have done this. You know, this would have made sense to do this. This is what you're trying to do. Uh, you're right. And there's, and that, you know, and I think that's a, a big problem that we have right now is a lack of empathy, a lack of going, let me put myself in that person's situation and all the difficulty of it and yeah. think about what I would do if. I was feeling scared, you know, spitless. And that's, you know, it, which clean, you're not going to be able to help. Clean that one up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I try sometimes. <laughs> well, <so> you, <laughs> but it, it reminds me, I remember of this, I remember a Facebook post one time and it had a video of this guy who was on a ladder and his friend was, you know, help, and he was on the ladder, not very high, and he was shaking he just was shaking so scared and he was coming down and they were talking him down and and the and the caption was this guy just lost his man card and it really pissed me off because you know i'm not scared of going up on a ladder in fact i'm so not scared of going up on a ladder that i fell off one and almost killed myself you know mm -hmm. <laughs> but i can't really understand how that how that feels to be up there but when someone is in that position where their mind has been has said, you just frozen them. It doesn't have anything to do with you're a man or not. This is just a biological thing that happens. And, and that's kind of what we're talking about. Just not on a, just an emergency basis. It's more about an ethical that when we get in these positions where our minds get really uh, conflicted with what to do and what should I do and what am I asked to do? What am I, what should I do based on my morals and my, and this fight or flight and this, you know, this kind of thing that's happening, uh, that it's really difficult and, and we need to have more empathy for people that are in these kinds of positions rather than going, you know, look at that, you know, mm -hmm piece of whatever you know this this fool or this person that's weak you know it's, it's just being humans we do yeah. uh put a lot of shoulds on ourselves and on other people what you should have done what i should have done uh and so from what we know
from a behavioral standpoint and a learning standpoint is that we do what we do for reasons. We should, if to say things should be some other way implies that it would have been it would have been different, but things weren't different. They are the way they are, and they turn out the way they turn out because of all of the things that happen in our histories, our episodic memories, our declarative memories, the influences of our culture, the neurochemistry in our brains. There's so much that explains why we do the things we do. Um, that I think it would be useful for us to understand other people and their motivations if we could, if we could keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and and to, to have grace for ourselves. Uh, I've seen so many people, uh, well, uh, you, 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 you were in the hospital with somebody, Melanie, uh, as a as a um, as a, uh, a daughter or a son, and um, you know you leave the you leave the room, and something happens to to that loved one that's in that bed, and you go, if I just stayed, there. you know. And yet, I, and when I hear somebody talking like that, I say, well, so. They were wearing a monitor. And what were you going to do? Are you trained in emergency medicine? <laughs> do you have a protocol to follow? Now, I don't say it and laugh at the same time. But, you know, the answer is no. I mean, how would you, how could you possibly know? So what useful, what's useful about that way of thinking? Um, and it brings, so people have survival guilt and they have, they have all kinds of things for that, that go back to their, you know, what they value, and uh, and it hurts them not to, not to have been able to be a part of that solution. Right. So that's where our minds go. Let me solve the problem that's that that didn't go the way I wanted it to go. And the more personal it is, the more it turns into second guessing and I should should haves. And, and instead of accepting that, that I can't, I couldn't, accepting is very difficult. And that's part of what we tell when we talked about our, to our clients about quite a bit is accepting the things that not agreeing or liking, but these things that I can't control that are outside of my control and to be able to focus on what I can, uh, myself, my part, my step, uh, but that's difficult because it's very unnatural. The, the more natural thing to do is to worry about it and to second guess and to, you know, even second guess other people or ourselves. And neither one helps. That's that's the bottom line. Yeah, I am. Um, that just as far as um, how that's related to what what we do, I think, um, you know, we see so many different things in the emergency department and a lot of it we've never seen before. You know, I'll get things I've never seen before, even read about or heard about, because there's just anything can come in at any time and you just have no idea, you know? And so a lot of times we're just doing the best we can with what our knowledge, the knowledge that we do have. And um, there are many times where, you know, I come home and think, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that, um, you know? And I try to just remind myself that, you know, nothing, you know, I didn't do anything very wrong and the patient did okay. So I can just learn from this minor mistake or lack in knowledge base. And, you know, the next time, if this ever shows up again, I'll know exactly what to do. Um, and I talk about that a lot with, cause I uh, supervise the advanced practice providers, the um, nurse practitioners and the PAs that work in our department. And I talk about that a lot with them because their knowledge base is, is not as strong. They're just not as well trained or not as you know thoroughly trained as the physicians. And so, in fact, I just had a conversation with one of them today, you know, something that she should have done differently, you know, and not, it, the patient turned out okay and everything was fine, but I had to give her the feedback so that she could learn, you know, about it. And, uh, you know, I told her, I said, you know, 
the patient's fine. You know, that's what's important. I said, now you'll know next time. That's what's, you know, it's good to make little mistakes and mm -hmm. we can learn from those and get better. Um, that's how we get better is by making little mistakes or noticing little gaps in our knowledge. But um, it's hard sometimes not to beat yourself up about it, especially when a lot of the things that we see end up being retrospectively looked at, you know, later on. <laughs> so there's a lot of should have, should have, should have, you know. That's a really good example. And, and it does a, a couple of things. One, one is it, it, it talked, it, it suggests to me, this is, this is why you need a mentor. You need somebody with some experience to help you uh, learn how to think about these um, situations that you get into so that you're not overwhelmed. Um, the physicians that, that I see sometimes in my practice will uh, second guess themselves. They don't have a mentor. I, I try to encourage them to find one because I can't be their mentor. I, I have a different profession. I can talk to them about things, but I can't I can't bring the medical background to that, but I see people that want to go back and attorneys do the same thing, by the way, look back at a chart to go to see and to worry about how things, something they may have done, you know, a month ago or in, in the case of uh, attorneys years ago, they go back and look at a, look at a brief that they wrote what kind of mistake did I make? Is this gonna come back to bite me? Did I do the right thing? I've seen dentists with the same issue, uh, worrying about the decision that they made. And um, we, we really need some support. Uh, and there's, you know, we talk about this all the time with with all kinds of professions. If, if a teacher, if a school teacher has a mentor uh, in the beginning years of their teaching experience, they're more likely to remain yeah. teachers. Yeah, that's, and that's a good profession to, to talk about because you talk about policies and test scores and you know the, the, the bureaucracy that runs things. I mean, I, teachers and the dealing with students with uh, behavior issues and you know, not trained in it and now you know school shootings and, and all those kinds of things that are coming up um you talk about uh somebody who's you know i want to teach kids you know i want to help kids learn you know and then it's not as simple as that uh it can be very overwhelming um you know, just to deal with all of the things that are outside of, it's like you were saying, Dave, the constraints that are put on people uh, that conflicts with what their idea about what their what their whole purpose is. Mm -hmm. It keeps them from from it sometimes. Um, they need support. They need uh, to be able to get perspective and to focus on, you know, to be able to focus on what they're doing and and uh and how to navigate all those kinds of things and then teach that in school you know teach about all the all that you know all this yeah. you know when you went to medical school melanie you probably didn't learn about all the all the different <laughs> different things you know that you're having to deal with that are outside of medicine yeah you, I had, mean, to, you had to figure that out on your own and, and get some help with that yeah, I mean, I when I was thinking about going to medical school, a lot of the physicians that I would go shadow or you know talk to about going to medical school, they would all tell me, "Don't do it, don't do it," <laughs> and I just be like, "Oh, ha ha ha." So. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that was one of the interesting findings in the in the uh, paper um, that we that we looked at before the call. Um, one of the de demographic findings. So this is by uh, uh, authors are Dutien, I guess it's Agel, Phillips, and Ingerson, and it's a 2009 paper um, on the impact of moral stress compared to other stressors on employee fatigue, job satisfaction, and turnover. Anyway, one of the things they talked about was this demographic difference 
um, that younger people had experienced more moral distress than um, their colleagues who had been in the field longer. Um, that uh, um, and and you know I I think there are a couple of, a couple of different ways to look at that. One is um, I, and I think is very true in the current moment. Um, young younger people are more sensitive to things like racism and misogyny and and uh, uh, anti LGBTQ stuff that that activates their moral radar and causes them moral distress when they see it in an organization. And older people may be more uh, less less concerned about it. But the other the other thing that another part of it is older people typically handle stress better. Um, and, and that's probably moral stress and other kinds of stress. They, um, their brains tend to be happier. So I think there's a, and I think sometimes that tension comes out in, in the dialogue that we hear in popular culture, this sort of generational bashing that goes back and forth, um, uh, boomers and millennials and, and that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, there, there are people who are tuned into very different kinds of things because of their life experiences. Um, and I do think these mentoring relationships are, are important. I've, I've met ministers, especially, especially people who do social work and social justice type ministry who get very bitter um, working with the homeless population or working with, you know, historically marginalized people who are, who are just so jaded, it's difficult for me to be around them. Um, I understand why they get like that. Um, and there are other people who I, I feel like have a very philosophical approach to the world. Like <laughs> they understand their own limitations and, you know, they are, um, they recognize the moral complexity of the world, but they're not overwhelmed by it or they're not, um, they're not burned out by it. Um, and, and I, I want to be like those people. <laughs> Like I don't, I don't want to become the bitter, per, the bitter, jaded kind of person. And I think those, I do think those mentoring and that support relationship, which is intergenerational, I think it has to be, like I think it, I think it needs to go both ways, to help people deal with um, um, the moral crises in whatever area of life they're operating, whatever their ministry or vocation is. I think helping ourselves deal with the stress um, and setting ourselves up so we can do that. I mean, that's what we do in counseling all the time. It's, it's, it's really, uh, so there is a good bit of talking when you're seeing a, a therapist uh, during the 50 minute or whatever the length of time is that you spend in a session. Uh, but, but it's what you do when you go out there in the world, how you set yourself up, you know, um, to to be able to cope with the stress. How do I need to think about this when I'm confronted with this particular type of situation? How am I going to think about it <clears throat> to really imagine that and uh, to practice it, right. to uh, talk with people about it <clears throat> so that when you find yourself in the situation, Boy, and, and the allergy is really beginning to affect my ability to talk. <clears throat> um, how do I need to think about it? Uh, what is the trigger? Um, we need to set our brains up so that we can recognize the cue and then engage with the thought and the behavioral pattern that we need that actually helps us to cope. Yep with the circumstances. Yeah, and the short and the, the short condensed version is getting ahead of it as much mm -hmm. as possible. This is a reality for all of us in some kind of way. We're gonna be faced with ethical dilemmas. Young people are gonna be faced with these situations where they're, they're not gonna understand. Uh, things aren't, you know, when you're young, everything's a concept, you know, oh yeah, it fits into this and then you get reality you have to go what's reality what's concept what how can i navigate all that stuff it's getting ahead of it as much as possible um setting ourselves up to uh, be able to to know what to do in those situations um this is a big deal i mean particularly having done this covid or still doing this covid thing for the past 
14, 15, 16 months, whatever it has been. Uh, even before this, I was, I was doing some reading. Uh, the National Academy of Medicine 2017 uh, emergency room physicians and general internists experienced the highest rates of burnout among physicians. Registered nurses report high rates of emotional exhaustion as well. Uh, physicians working in the speci specialties at the front lines, for example, emergency medicine, family medicine, general internal medicine, neurology, among the highest risk of burnout. And the, these statistics go on, I could, I could quote a bunch. It's a little scary mm -hmm. to me. Uh, so there are all kinds of people that do care. Uh, counselors do care, teachers do care, preachers do care, uh, parents do care. <laughs> you know, so we have a lot of people engaged in caring and, and what kind of support do we need, right? Just to live, we're gonna to have to do a pretty good job of helping uh, physicians, for example, with healthcare and, and, and the healthcare community uh, to, to feel supported. Mm -hmm. And- part of, that, part, of that, part of that is get, helping them, people get away from it. <laughs> yes, yes. And to do fun things and to have balance work-life balance kinds of situations and exercise and sleep well and those things that we always recommend. And if we're, if it helps us to wear a mask or get a vaccination, that would be supportive. Yes. Right. Is that right? That's right. Uh, I remember, so I remember hearing a, do, a emergency room doctor. She, she was, she decided to do, COVID, you know, she's going to be the ER COVID and she traveled around and she was ready to do that. And she went through the year and she was interviewed and she was really worried about, you know, people not getting vaccinated and people not taking precautions and doing this. She says, I'm really worried that the doctors are not going to be able to do this again, that they're just not going to be able to do this face the stuff that we faced, you know, and she was kind of pleading with people to, you know, do your part to, to help, you know, to help, but also because you may, you may, we may, you might find ourselves without, with a shortage of people that are, have the capacity to help. It's motivation for me to, to do, to do my part. Yeah. I had, you know, close friends and, um, people that I'm close to that were kind of during the, you know, worst part of the pandemic, we're still kind of you know, naysayers um, about, you know, mask wearing and, and things like that. And it, it was, that was difficult because, um, you know, trying to, to explain to them, you know, no, this, I mean, we're really, this is really happening. I'm not making it up. I mean, and, you know, but um, uh, that definitely, I think, uh, have now all pretty much all my close friends have been vaccinated and that's um that has been a huge uh show of support i think um mm -hmm. for us um but um yeah the um the the difficult most difficult part probably uh at least for me about um treating patients during the pandemic was the absence of patients families um, in the department, uh, when their mm. loved ones were very sick, um, that makes it not only a lot difficult, more difficult for us to do our job, um, but also is just so much worse for the patients. Yeah. Yeah. That's just, it's just hard to even imagine. Well, Paul, I think this is a, a subject that has a lot of, uh, potential for the future. Um, Maybe we could uh, entice Dave and Melanie okay. to join us again. Uh, so that would be great. We could, we could target and talk a little bit more. Uh, I'd like to explore the the uh, concept of of support. Melanie's talking about having a family there for support, uh, but also in this in this realm of of how do you help young people 
get into a profession and then stay with it to be able to manage the stress? Uh, how do you get that mentor person or that support group? Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, and, and also how can we help people talk about ways to sort of check, you know, we talk about mindfulness and awareness to be aware of the stress, that we're aware of the ethical and moral dilemmas that are happening in the workplace and different places and being able to kind of keep a check on that to be able to reach out for help and support, to, to know that this is, this, is, this is how I'm doing today. How am I doing with my job today? How am I doing with these decisions? So that it doesn't become uh, this embedded thing that, that's never talked about and then all of a sudden, People are having anxiety attacks and needing to go to counseling because they don't know how they can't they can't manage their anger and it's just really about this moral dilemma that work that's building up. Uh, so creating some uh, some tools for awareness, uh, just regular check-ins with how am I how am I doing? Do I need some help? You know, do I need to talk to somebody about this? Well, why don't we? That, it's, it's, it's all good subjects for continued exploration. Sounds good to me. All right. Well, thanks to everybody for watching. Thank you uh, so much to Melanie and, uh, and Dave. And as usual, Dr. Barnhart, Dr. David Barnhart, uh, for the, being with us today. The older and, uh, guy. The, the older guy. So thanks for watching, everybody. And I uh, hope you have a good day. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Freedom growth and identity, peace or brutality, truth, false reality, happiness or misery, empathy or injury, unity or weaponry, decency or crudity, order mess, more or less, easy stress, no guess, we have the power, cause you and me got a mind. Got a mind.